introduce Ivan Asher, who will be introducing our guest, Tom Dunn. I would like to invite everyone at the conclusion of this, around 5 o'clock, to come up to the ninth floor of, the, of this building, uh, to 929, for a reception, which you'll have a chance to have a little less uh, formal of a conversation, not only with Professor Dunn, but with everybody else. Uh, in addition, I would like to remind everyone that C21 has a number of lectures coming up next semester, including, for many people, surprisingly, one the very first Friday of classes. So uh, on January 29th, I believe, we're going to have the feminist geographer City Cats coming. So be aware as you're thinking through your, your beginning of the semester events that there's going to be a uh, Center for 21st Century Studies event right away, a Center for 21st Century Studies event right away. I would like to introduce Ivan Asher, uh, currently, though not for long, assistant professor at, uh, in our political science department. <laughs> you can take that either way. Yeah. <laughs> um, who's going to introduce our speaker? So, I hope my fate doesn't hang on this introduction. So, uh, uh, I will be brief. Um, this was going, as I started thinking about how to introduce Tom Dunn, it ended up being more introduction to Kenneth Ferguson. Uh, and so I'm, I'm midway between those two. But I'll just say that I was asked recently uh, at another conference if I would not introduce uh, the keynote speaker at that time. And uh, on the grounds that it's somebody I, I knew whose work I had translated and uh, <coughs> who in fact published uh, my book. And, and so these seem like perfectly good reasons to ask him to introduce him. And they also seem like perfectly good reasons for me uh, to say uh, I would prefer not to. Uh, uh, and, and it worked. They asked somebody else, and I was off, off the hook. Uh, and then when Ken Ferguson asked me recently if I would introduce Tom Dunn, my first impulse was to uh, once again politely decline. Um, but mostly, my first impulse was to say, why don't you do it? And then uh, that's when I, uh, and, and, and Ken uh, basically said I would prefer not doing it. He said, you see, Ken, uh, Tom, Tom was my go-to guy. And so he, he basically uh, explained it in this one sentence why it would be impossible for him, uh, who knows Tom, Tom both personally and intellectually and has known him for some time, to introduce, introduce him. So uh, it, it still makes me deeply unqualified to introduce Tom Dunn, but I at least understand Ken's reticence to do this. But when Ken said this, it also helped me make sense of, of, of several things. One of them was Ken Ferguson himself, who I thought was too generous, uh, and, and, and his range and his choice of topics. Uh, and then I realized he actually came from somewhere. And that one of the people who uh, who might be that somewhere was was Tom Dunn himself, um, whose work, if you don't know it, you know, you'll discover uh, covers a formidable range. Uh, he moves from one genre to the next, from continental to American philosophy. He writes about writes with Michel Foucault, Stanley Cabell, and Emerson, and he also moves from the the high to the low. Uh, one of his recent books begins with a meditation on Cordelia and, and Lear, and, and goes then from there to inventors, and um, all the while dwelling in the most intimate of, of matters and uh, the question of loneliness as a, as a way of life. And his most recent book, uh, which I don't know, is, is about a uh, painter whose work uh, Tom, I think, discovered not so long ago, I don't know, but somebody who, uh, with whom he became friends. So there's, there's a distinct quality to Tom's work um, that I'm not qualified to, to, to speak about um, in, in any great detail. So um, what I'll say is that, and this is, and I know exactly where this will take me, except thankfully to, to the speaker himself, uh, which is something about Tom Dunn, the, the word made flesh. Uh, because I, I don't know Tom Dunn very well, but I've heard the name um, for, um, for some time. And in, in graduate school, there was a, there's a, um, I went to grad school at Berkeley, and there's a, the graduate students have their own special part of the library where they can, they can 
sleep and, and flourish uh, in, in company of other graduate students. And there are some books there, high use books, you know, Foucault, Levinas, Tom Dunn. And I remember the spine of this one book, United States. I remember where it is in the library. And I remember my relation to it. One of kind of curious fascination. Like, okay, so this is this is political theory. It wasn't quite where I was at, but there was something about it that was very seductive. And I remember the spine, I remember the the, 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 the print, I remember the the uh, the series of which it was a part, edited by William Conley. And I guess I made a mental note of this. And then eventually for many um, nights spent in that library, I landed a job at UMass Amherst. Now, those of you who know Amherst, um, there are those of us who live, you know, who work or spend time in Amherst, and then there are those who spend time at Amherst. And there's there's a gulf between the two, um, between the clubs and, and the Ken Ferguson's of the world. But but bridging that gap, it. Um, it's Amherst Coffee and Ravens Coffee, so where, where the two meet. And that's where I had the privilege of encountering Tom Dunn on occasion. Tom Dunn thanks uh, the staff of Ravens Coffee in his book. Um, uh, I thank uh, the staff of Amherst Coffee for allowing me to, to, to meet Tom. But two more things, and this is, uh, this is where the word, word eventually becomes flesh. Um, after this encounter with the spine of the book, um, I, my next encounter, I think, with the name Tom Dunn was through a student in West Ham Peace, who was a really quite talented, gifted student at Amherst College, who ended up being in our graduate program at UMass, thanks to the intercession of, of Dunn. And, and then finally, um, most recently, at a conference I, I presented a paper at, I saw in the audience uh, Tom Dunn sitting next to Ken Ferguson. It, it made me feel much better. It also made me feel better that Tom Dunn at the end said some kind of words about the panel, said something to the panel. Later that evening, some guy at the bar told me that my paper was complete bullshit. <laughs> and so this brings me to the question. <laughs> that is to say, as we as we live our lives as academics or aspiring academics or graduate school to job and wherever else that life may take us, we encounter certain names, certain books, and oftentimes uh, We'll also encounter the person, but sometimes we don't. But I was fortunate enough to encounter that name and, that, and, and follow it and, and have it reoccur in, in my experience. And for this, I'm deeply grateful. And so, for this, I give you a up. <laughs> Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. 
The rebranding of GOP has control of the national government and effective control of most state governments in large part thanks to the dark money spent by the Koch brothers and their minions over the years, as you folks know only too well here in Wisconsin, having been early victims of the tsunami of money. And as they always seem to do, the national press and other news media are in the process of normalizing Trump's extreme politics. What has been the response to Trump's election by the supposed liberal intelligentsia is another question that came up for me over the past two or three post-election weeks. A memo made the rounds on Twitter a couple days after the election in the form of a photo shot taken by a law professor of a couple of pages from Richard Gordy's 1998 book, Achieving Our Country. Here's what Gordy wrote back then. Members of labor unions and unorganized, unskilled workers will sooner or later realize that the government is not even trying to prevent wages from sinking or prevent jobs from being exported. Around the same time, they will realize that suburban white-collar workers, themselves desperately afraid of being downsized, are not going to be taxed to provide social benefits for anyone else. At that point, something will crack. The non-suburban electorate will decide that the system has failed and start looking around for a strong man to vote for. Someone willing to assure them that once he is elected to smuggle bureaucrats, overpay bond salesmen, and postmodernist professors, uh, back in the good old days, <laughs> will no longer be calling the shots. One thing that is very likely to happen is that the gains made in the past 40 years by black and brown Americans and by homosexuals, this was 1998, will be wiped out. Popular <coughs> contempt for women will come back into fashion. All the resentment which badly educated Americans feel about having their manners dictated to them by college professors will find an outlet. That's the first item. Second item, where these things picked up, albeit with much less sophistication, and also not as a prophecy, but as a post-election accusation against the Democratic Party, by Mark Lila, a political theorist from Columbia University in an op-ed column in the New York Times entitled The End of Identity Liberalism. While the title sort of tells the story of the essay, it is basically a polemic which claims the decades of political correctness, culminating in making central in this election issues of identity, have resulted in a politics of division. As he puts it at one point, to paraphrase Bernie Sanders, America is sick and tired of hearing about liberals at the end of bathrooms. There is an interesting rejoinder to that in this morning's New York Times. So in an election when race baiting, dehumanizing immigrants, demonizing the world religion, and misogyny were core campaign tactics by Donald Trump, designed to encourage some 60% of his base voters, it turns out that it actually was the Democratic Party's political correctness, not neoliberal economic policy pressed by a bipartisan elite that created the deep divisions laid bare in this election. Aside from the seeming ignorance concerning why African Americans, Latinos, Muslims, and women might have concerns that would lead them to seek justice through the assertion and protection of civil rights, Lilla suggests that by playing the identity card, as he put it, the Democratic Party led white men to adopt the very tactics of identity politics used by these various minorities and identify themselves as a persecuted group. The politics of grievance as though this was something new. In the weeks following the publication of Zabuelo's analysis as the lead story in the Sunday Review, he was interviewed repeatedly on NPR programs, angrily protesting against those who suggested that maybe he was looking at the wrong end of the telescope, claiming that they were proving his point by calling him out on his implicit white male privileging. I dwell on this post-election diagnosis. Of course, it's not the only reaction to the election and I have long Bob thought of Mark Lula to be a fool, because it reflects the domination in this electoral cycle of what we might call a politics of subtraction, in which the idea of coalition building condemned by Lula is replaced by the vague appeals to unity across difference. But the unity that people like Lula seek presumes that those who are already call themselves the center of politics will continue to dictate in terms of what is valuable and what is not. And it is, of course, possible to appeal to economic justice while appealing to social justice. Just as it is possible to vote for Donald Trump for president because you want jobs to come back and because he appeals to your racism. Many of us can walk and chew gum at the 
the same time. What Lilla fails to see is that Trump's campaign followed what an old tradition in American politics, attributed to politics, is all about, the imposition of a negative identity upon those by the dominant group, white men, who are defined as the normal center of political life, as the ordinary people around whom all others must orbit. Blacks are not white, Latinos are not white, women are not white, men. The best they can achieve is honorary white man status. Immigrants are not white initially, but as Michael Rogan noted in his 1996 classic, Black Face, White Noise, a reason for the persistence of racism in American life is that its succeeding waves of immigrants were initially treated like black people. In the mid-1920s, when he was a child, my own father's house was shot at by members of the KKK in central Pennsylvania. And my mother's farm was the site of a cross burning. They eventually became white after a generation or two of assimilation, that assimilation including accepting the racial distinctions of the dominant group. I grew up in a racist household. I like to give this other example of the sort of thought reflected in this sort of normalization. At the time of Rodney King riots, a white man from the bedroom community of Seen Valley, where most of the LA police officers lived rather than in LA proper, put it this way. There's a black person up our street, and we say hi like he's a normal person. In other words, what's happened in this election cannot be called a refusal of the status quo or a collective act of political resistance, because those who voted for Trump were actually afraid to reject what has been and continues to be the mythical status quo. They have elected a candidate whose policy proposals, to the extent that he made any, were and are incoherent and or unrealizable. The base, basic undemocratic corporate power structure remains intact, as he has already demonstrated with his first cabinet picks. The election of Trump is best described, I think, as an act of reaction, perhaps the most extreme reactionary response to economic conditions faced by the country since the Civil War era. That war actually came to an end, not with the surrender of Lee to grant mathematics, but with the election of 1876. And that year, Tilden, the Democrat, won the popular vote. Through remarkable political chicanery, the Republicans, by challenging the elections of four different states, succeeded in throwing the election into the House of Representatives and then eventually to a special commission, resulting in the election of Rutherford B. Hayes. This is obscure history, but there's a point to it. The bargain worked out then between the Republicans and what were called the Democratic Redeemers, which was the public face of the original KKK, was an agreement to withdraw federal troops from South Carolina and Louisiana, the two remaining occupied states, and to ignore the civil rights laws passed in the wake of the Civil War, effectively ending reconstruction and informally reestablishing slavery through a combination of sharecropping and mass incarceration. Then as now, conditions of extreme economic inequality undergirded the economy, that is now, those who are still benefiting the most from the situation when they perceive falsely the immediate threat to their continued way of life, reacted by doubling down on their own identity as white people. That is now, voter suppression and demonization combined with machinery of an electoral college that by design was intended to curb democracy, resulted in the selection of a president who got fewer votes than his opponent. So, we who believe in social justice and democracy should be worried. Because one scenario that could play out over the next four years is an upending of whatever progress has been made in the securing of rights for those groups who have annoyed the Mark Villas of the world with all their whining about being shot, being beaten, being humiliated, and being imprisoned on a massive scale. The nomination of Senator Jeffrey Beauregard Sessions, Republican of Alabama, a documented racist for the position of Attorney General, and the elevation of another racist, Steve Bannon, as Trump's senior advisor, gives a line to the idea that the dominant force in encouraging Trump voters or in motivating Trump himself was a desire to produce new jobs and restore working class Americans to their former state of prosperity. Those voters who did vote for Trump for that reason are soon to be disappointed. The question concerning the great reaction then is how far it will go. That is, for how long, and to what extent will the political establishment allow the core ideology of white nationalism to result in policies that threaten their economic prosperity? Who knows? 
The early chaos of the transition is a good sign for the process that's of a successful administration, but then again, fascism usually thrives on chaos. The vision within its own party as well as the demonization of the opposition. And as I've already noted, corporate power seems to be in the driver's seat. So could there be an alternative, a great refusal that could counter the great reaction of 2016? Is it possible for there to be a form of refusal that is not reactive in character? Or that is somehow reactive in a way that does not deflect us into racism, sexism, and xenophobia? My intuition when Kennan invited me here was to draw upon a famous refusal in literature, namely that of Bartleby, who famously refuses by saying, I would prefer not to. I'm very impressed that I refuse not to work for you, actually, because often it goes on. So please bear with me while I reconstruct the story, emphasizing what for me are its most important elements. Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener was published as one of the stories in the Piazza Tales in five years before the Civil War. It is set, of all places, on Wall Street. The narrator of the story is an elderly successful real estate attorney who never goes to court but prepares legal documents for all sorts of clients. He once enjoyed a sinecure with New York State as a master of chancery, but the office was eliminated under a new state constitution. He is, he says, someone who believes that the easy life is the best. And that is the sort of attorney he has tried to be throughout his career. His object in setting down the story of Bartleby is to tell the reader something about the sort of men he had worked with all his life, of whom nothing to his knowledge had ever been written before, law copyists or scriveners. But in choosing to write the biography of Bartleby, of whom he knows practically nothing, he does, does so not because Bartleby's story will provide great insight into the art of copying, but to the contrary. Bartleby is largely unknown. I believe, the narrator writes, that no materials exist for a full and satisfactory biography of this man. It's an irreparable loss to literature. This essential anonymity of Bartleby conflicts powerfully with the idea that the point of the story is to tell us something about the sort of men who are scriveners. The narrator knows this, knows of Bartleby's strange status, but he lets the magnitude of Bartleby Drop from, he lets the marginality of Bartleby drop from the story, or so it seems to me. Of course, the narrator does mention other employees who have nicknames, Turkey, Nippers, and Ginger Nut. Turkey and Nippers are like emotional bookends. Turkey would begin the day with a florid face, but after the noon hour it positively blazed, and his work became reckless and too energetic. He was, it seems to be implied, an alcoholic, but the narrator only hints at this. Nippers suffered from poor digestion in the morning, but his stomach improved in the afternoon. So turkey worked well in the morning, nippers in the afternoon. The third of this triumvirate, Ginger Nut, was a scrivener apprentice, so to speak. A 12-year-old office boy who got his nickname from the spicy round flat cakes the other scriveners would send him out to get his snacks. Bartleby doesn't seem to have a personality that makes him worthy of a nickname. What's his story? He has not. But scriveners were 19th century Xerox machines, making written copies of legal documents that would be precise and full representations of the original documents. That is all that Bartleby is. It is for this function that Bartleby is hired, and he does with great industry, working day and night. But his industry is in its own way alarming to his boss. He writes, I should have been quite delighted with his application had he been more cheerfully industrious. But he wrote on silently, palely, mechanically. Barbie then was already being judged, not for his performance as a scrivener, but for his attitude. His attitude problem is revealed when the secondary job of the scrivener comes into play. That is the work of verifying the accuracy of this copy word by word. Barbie's initial refusal is to decline to review a short document, to examine a small document with me, a task the narrator describes as trivial. Bartleby, without even getting up from the semi-privacy of his desk, says for the first time, I would prefer not to. 
This, the narrator notes, happened on the third day of Bartleby's employment, and he states the same sentence three times. With Melville, we always have to be careful about these New Testament references because you don't really know where it's going with them. And I've never figured that one out. Someone out there who really knows Melville can tell me later. Eventually, imagining this incident and to just be a quirk on Bartleby's part, the lawyer gives the assignment to Nippers. But several days later, after Bartleby completes the copying of four very lengthy documents, he's called in to help examine them along with turkey nippers and even ginger nut, so that there would be four readers of copies while the lawyer would read from the original. This is important, the lawyer emphasizes, because a big lawsuit is in the workings. Again, Bartleby says, I would prefer not to. He then varies it a little impressed, saying, I prefer not to. Soliciting the opinion of the other three scriveners concerning the rightness of his demand of his demands on Bartleby, the lawyer finds Turkey agreeing with him blandly and never suggesting that Bartleby be kicked out of the office. It's the morning. Had it been the afternoon, their opinions would have been reversed. Ginger Nut suggests that Bartleby is, quote unquote, a little loony. And so it goes. When the employer comes to realize that Bartleby never leaves the office seems to be living on ginger nuts exclusively and gradually is ceasing to work at all. The employer is perplexed. A lengthy passage here that I will write to you because it's important. Here he explains, quote, nothing so aggravates an earnest person as a passive resistance. If the individual so resisted be not of not inhumane temper and the resisting one perfectly harmless in his passivity, then in the better moods of the former, he will endeavor charitably to construe to his imagination what proves impossible to be solved by his judgment. Even so, for the most part, I regarded Bartleby in his ways. Poor fellow, I thought. He means no mischief. It is plain that he intends no insolent. His aspect sufficiently evinces that his eccentricities are involuntary. He is useful to me. I can get along with him. If I turn him away, the chances are he will fall in with some less indulgent employer. And then he will be rudely treated and perhaps driven forth miserably to starve. Yes, here I can cheaply purchase a delicious self-approval to befriend Bartleby. To humor him in his strange willfulness will cost me little or nothing. While I lay up in my soul what will eventually prove a sweet morsel for my conscience. But this mood was not variable. The passiveness of Bartleby sometimes irritated me. I felt strangely goaded on to encounter him in a new opposition, to elicit some angry sparks from him, answerable to my own. But indeed, I might well have essayed to strike fire with my knuckles again against the bit of Windsor soap, unquote. Pretty Rococo and Florida language. Right? And so, of course, he does try to go to Bartleby, but to no avail. Bartleby would prefer not to prefers not to. He becomes permanently exempt from doing anything other than copying. But more things happen or don't happen, as the case may be. Eventually, the employer discovers that Bartleby is living in the office and decides that this situation is intolerable and cannot continue. He tries again to reason with him, asks personal questions concerning his birthplace or anything about himself. He would prefer not to. When asked rhetorically to be a little reasonable and to start doing the work the others do, Bartleby responds, I would prefer not to be a little reasonable. And the lawyer soon notes that the word prefer is beginning to infiltrate into all of the conversations of the office. Nippers is using the term thoughtlessly, Turkey is as well. He says, Turkey, oh, prefer? Oh, yes, queer word. I never use it myself. But, sir, as I was saying, if he would but prefer. The scriveners are being unconsciously afflicted by, or more precisely, being contaminated by Bartleby's, Bartleby's language. The next day, Bartleby announces he will do no more writing at all. And while the lawyer at first thinks he won't write because his eyes are going bad, a few days later he announces, I have given up copying. At this point, he has nothing to do in the office and does nothing. The lawyer demands that he leave, and he responds, as always, I would prefer not to. The lawyer gives him six days, promising severance, but Bartleby remains. A climactic confrontation, will you or will you not quit me? I demanded in a sudden passion, advancing quite close to him. 
I would prefer not to quit you, he replied, emphasizing the not. This touches the lawyer, and he returns to his model of Christian charity, magnanimously allowing Bartley, Bartleby to stay, doing nothing, until his clients start asking questions about the presence of this person who does nothing, thus embarrassing him. Well, that as it often is, that constant friction of the liberal minds wears out it, lacks the best resolves of the more generous, unquote. He could be marked a lot of himself. So he then does the only thing he can think to do, and that is move his offices to another location, leaving Bartleby behind the old. But Bartleby haunts him in the form of the old landlord who complains to the lawyer that the new tenant has this person won't leave the premises. They kick him out of the office and he works in the hallways. The lawyer is terrified that he's being named as being the person responsible for Bartleby, unlike Peter denies responsibility for him. But he does go to see him and offers to help him find another job, say a clerkship in a dry goods store. And here Bartleby's response shifts a little bit. There is too much confinement about that. No, I would not like a clerkship, but I am not particular. This new refrain, I am not particular, is eventually followed up when the lawyer even offers to take him home with him with another refusal. No, at present, I would prefer not to make any changes at all. Eventually, Barbie is arrested for vagrancy and taken to the tombs, where even though the lawyer arranges for him to be fed privately by a man named Grubb, he prefers not to eat. And so he dies, a hunger artist, before cock is as a coda, we learn that Bartleby's prior job has been as a subordinate clerk in the dead letter office of Washington, a job from which he had been removed when the administration changed. And the final line of the story in the coda is, ah, Bartleby, ah, humanity. What? Okay. What do we make of the story of refusal, of passive resistance as the narrator describes it? First, let us notice something concerning the demands being made on Bartleby by the lawyer. He is not only to copy, to function as a producer, he is also to join in the proofreading of the other scriveners. Even prior to this demand being made upon him, his silent, pale, mechanical working habit disturbs the lawyer. He is not cheerfully industrious. In the making of the indebted man, a book about the rise of finance capital is the key to understanding neoliberalism. Maruzio Lazzarato, following Marx, makes note of what happens when a rich man gives credit to a poor man. This is a risk for the capitalist should the poor creditor die before repaying. But it also establishes a moral relationship between the poor man and the creditor. Lazzarato here is deeply in debt to Nietzsche on this matter. But it also establishes, you know, while Bartleby is in a wage relationship with the lawyer, the lawyer seems to think that Bartleby owes him. Here is a detail I failed to mention earlier. The lawyer is disconcerted when he discovers that Bartleby has in his desk a savings bank. Rather than comment directly on this evidence of Bartleby's financial security, the lawyer presents a new diagnosis of Bartleby as being, quote, the victim of an innate and incurable disorder. I might give alms to his body, but his body did not pain him. It was his soul that suffered, and his soul I could not reach." Unquote. The lawyer cannot reach the soul of Bartleby, because Bartleby is not in his debt, refuses to be in his debt, and thus falls out of the moral economy the lawyer wishes to reinforce. It is as though the sign of Bartleby's autonomy of the savings bank Makes the, makes the lawyer realize that Bartleby's refusal is not to be denied. Back to Lazarado, who writes, credit entails the creditor's moral judgment of the debtor. That is, a subjective measure of value. But not only are the skills and know-how of the worker evaluated, so too are the poor man's actions in society, social virtues, conduct, reputation. That is, his lifestyle, his social behavior, his values, his very existence. It is through debt that capital is able to appropriate not only the physical and intellectual abilities the poor man employs in his labor, but also the social and existential forces. Barbara refusal becomes more global the more the lawyer presses him on his conduct. 
The more that he seeks details of Bartleby's personal life, the more that Bartleby resists by receiving. Lanzarato concludes his study of neoliberalism and finance capital with a powerful observation regarding how debt and the financial crisis of 2007 forward is transfigured by the politics. He writes, the illusions of the freedom and independence of human capital are those, or those of the information society and cognitive capitalism are no longer available. To speak like Marx, it can only extend and expand absolute surplus value, that is, prolonged labor time, increase unpaid work, lower living standards, multiply precarious work, diminish life expectancy, etc. This should be familiar to us in the contest over overtime pay for managers. Right? The executive order that is going to be reversed as soon as Trump becomes president. Austerity, the demand for sacrifices, and the creation of the subjective figure of the debtor do not constitute a rough st stretch as we advance toward new growth the techniques of power whose authoritarianism, now devoid of anything liberal, can alone guarantee the reproduction of power relations. Since 2007, passive resistance, having forgone the neoliberal program, has in various ways begun, and now represents the only hope for escaping the government techniques of the technocratic governments, governments of debt. This is Lazarus' conclusion. <coughs> in this sense, Bartleby is the model, or perhaps the prophet, for passive resistance in our time. That's one. On another comparable register, I think, we might note that Bartleby is insistent on his autonomy as a worker. And this insistence upsets the entire moral economy the lawyer is seeking to enforce. Indeed, the enforcement of workplace norms is so naturalized in this story. Bartleby's eccentric behavior pushes him further and further to the margins of, boy, is he ever weird. But the lawyer fails to see that it is he who is weird, participating in the attempt to construct something by making Bartleby weird. The disciplinary subject made famous by Foucault can only be brought into existence on the basis of this contrasting weirdness. In Discipline and Punish, Foucault famously states in the introductory chapter, the man described to us whom we are invited to free is already himself the effect of a subjection, much more profound than himself. A soul inhabits him and brings him into existence, which is itself a factor in the mastery the power exercises over his body. The soul is the effective instrument of a political anatomy. The soul is the prison of the body. Barclay's soul is unreachable by the lawyer, or so he tells us. This is a failure of the disciplinary apparatus. Indeed, he almost matches the account Foucault gives of the vagabond in Foucault's chapter on illegalities and delinquencies. This is a chapter relatively neglected, um, but crucial to Foucault's overall argument. Illegalities and delinquencies are necessary for this kind of function. But let us listen to what Foucault describes here about the vagabond who appears before the court. All the illegalities that the court defined as offenses, the accused reformulated as the affirmation of a living force, the lack of home as vagabondage, the lack of master as independence, the lack of work as freedom, the lack of a timetable as the fullness of days and nights. Foucault cites a description of what the judge in the case said while arguing against this delinquent and sentencing him to two years in a workshop. Quote, one sleeps at home, said the judge, because in fact for him, everything must have a home. Some dwelling, however magnificent or mean. His task is not to provide one, but to force every individual to live in one. One exists only when fixed in definite relations to domination. Who do you work with?" Unquote. In this frame of reference, Bartleby resists as a delinquent. He refuses to work with others, refuses to have a home. He would prefer not to. But in the 21st century, we have come a long way from the founding acts of disciplinary society. In fact, in many ways, we live in a post-disciplinary world. Indeed, the question that so many Trump voters have asked is, 
can we find anybody to work for? That is, what are the terms of surrender of finance capital, and who is doing the surrendering? But there is more to it than that, of course. Bartleby is, for the most part, silent. But a signature sentence I would prefer not to has also attracted a lot of attention for its phrase, strangeness as a phrase. I want to turn to a tighter focus on this phase, phrase for a moment, which will lead us to the conclusion here. Thanks for your patience so far. Prefer is a key word, defined as to favor one thing or action over another. When combined with the not to, though, the phrase becomes grammatically confusing. Preferences to be for something. So when it's kind of coupled with the negative, it points toward an against that is open-ended. Avoid, so to speak. Punning on avoid, avoidance. But more, why the word would? I prefer not to might suffice, but would is defined in the OED as the feeling or expression of a conditional or undecided desire or intention. So to qualify his preference further complicates this formula moving Bartleby's intention further away from our immediate grasp. In a helpful essay about the language of Bartleby called Language and Labor, Silence and Stasis, Literary theorist from Cornell named Kevin Patel points to Jill Deleuze's reading of I Would Prefer Not To as functioning as an agrammatical formula in the unusual sense that it can't be placed either as propositional or representational truth on the one hand or performative speech on the other. This deep dissettlement produces a sense of unease and for Deleuze, Patel suggests the sentence stands as an example of an autonomy of the unease Melville's entire literary practice produces in the field of English language literature. This unease has to do first with the radical passivity of Bartley's, Bartley's statement. The tell quotes from Rieslein show um, this possibility. This is from the writing of the disaster. Quote, this is the core of refusal which Bartleby, this Bartleby the Scrivener's inexorable, I would prefer not to express this, an abstention which has never had to be decided upon, which precedes all decisions and which is not so much a denial as more than that, an abdication. I will not do it, would still have signified an energetic determination, calling forth an equally energetic contradiction. I would prefer not to, belongs to the infiniteness of patience, no dialectical intervention can take hold of such possibility." Unquote. For Deleuze, such radical passivity and its refuting of an oppositional position that could subsequently be overcome by greater powers establishes through its fracturing of expectations a minor literature, a literature of impersonality, something regionally American in its operation. The American patchwork, he writes, becomes the law of Melville's oeuvre, devoid of the center of an upside down or a right side up. And Deleuze sees this patchwork as in keeping with the American ethos of freedom and a society of brothers, a federation of men and goods, the community of anarchistic individuals. In a surprising moment of dimensionality, he even cites the founding fathers, mentioning by name Thomas Jefferson. I'm not certain of this conclusion at all. I would suggest instead that Bartleby's refusal is something else, a refusal that is a stoppage, a form of general strife, generated in the passivity of a single individual, in this sense, a parody of the romance of Thoreau's civil disobedience, when Thoreau says, let your life be a counterfriction to stop the machine. In an essay on how to fight against climate change deniers, William Connolly has posed the idea of the general strike in Bartleby like terms, countering general strike to proto fascist movements, suggesting, by the way, a particular vulnerability in the United States to fascism, writing in 2000. In asking activists 
mysteriously considered the general strike. He describes it thusly. Such a strike will involve withdrawal from work and travel, joint to reductions in consumption above the levels needed for subsistence. Bartleby here could serve as a prophet of the general strike, but he also serves as a prophet of what might be called following Judith Butler, a politics of precarity. For thee, there is no doubt that Bartleby's position from which he issues his refusal is one of great precarity, and he does starve in the end. We are in an era entering the Anthropocene when there are numerous threats of an existential character facing humankind in much of the animal world as well, as well as the plant world. Underlying the fears of white working class men about the future of work are deeper anxieties that they share with us. They may be thought of as the canary in the coal mine with a deeper precarity. Catastrophic weather events, drought, <coughs> Water and other resource wars, forced migrations, border wars, and rising austerity everywhere, all lying in the background, all increasingly touch our lives in common. The Tennessee fire of today are only the most recent of at least 18 billion dollar plus national disasters in the United States in 2016, up from 12 for the total tally in 2000. Most of these disasters strike in the flyover country that elected Trump. What is happening in Standing Rock in North Dakota gives us a hint of what could come. 2,000 veterans have just arrived there to provide a human shield for the protesters who are trying to settle in acting positively in the name of resisting a future of gross destruction. Bartleby's refusal and its radical passivity may not seem like much of a hope for those of us who want to hold up hope. A hope not hopeless but unhopeful is the way he always put it at the turn of the 20th century, a century he prophesied would be dominated by the question of race. Boy, was he right. In the 21st century. Well, here at the Center <laughs> for 21st Century Studies, I would suggest we already understand that a reaction reinforcing the status quo, what we are now experiencing, is not likely to reduce and will more likely intensify our precarious condition. So we need to ask, if not Bartley's refusal, Bar Bartley's refusal, what form of stoppage, what form of resistance can we embrace? Thanks. Resistance remind me a great deal of the work of James C. Scott back in the 90s, uh, Weapons of the Week. But I suspect I'm missing something if I put the two together as uh, uh, obvious parallels. How is uh, Bartleby different from the malingerers uh, that James C. Scott talked about? Yeah, I think one of the limitations on Bartleby as a figure is his radical individuality. Right. Uh, Jim Scott's work in, uh, on that and also on the anarchist communities among the Montagnards uh, emphasizes very much the network of communities that are established. Um, and it, it, one of the reasons why Bartleby is both incredibly attractive to me in a certain way, uh, but also uh, dangerous in another way, has precisely to do with the, with the, with the, the radical passivity that, that cannot make that connection to others. <coughs> Um, I, I think such people can serve as inspirations, but you know, I was, I was saying earlier to someone, you know, Henry David Thoreau, as much as we might admire him, was a real pain in the ass to everybody, precisely because of that inability, right? Mm -hmm. When Emerson speaks of holding his arm, it's like holding one of the tree. He was kind of onto something. So, so, and, and I also have to admit to you, when I was 
writing this, I did not have Jim Scott in mind. So in the rewrites, I will have to be thinking about that. Yeah. Pretty grim, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, and there could also right now among us be a politics of mourning going on. Of what? Of mourning. Um, I just wanted to, um, could you elaborate a little bit on your use of the phrase, the hunger artist? It's not in the story, but it's clearly, you know, you're from Kafka, and in terms of, I mean, do you have any thoughts about the hunger strike? Um, I'm thinking about the hunger strike in terms of, you know, a silent body, a very powerful silent body, and I'm thinking about the Irish hunger strikes in particular. Um, but the power of their silence allowed an empty body to have everything projected onto it. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm just kind of wondering yeah. about your phrase, the hunger artist, and about the politics of the yeah, hunger yeah, well, strike. Yeah, well, that gesture to Kafka, I, I knew I would get in trouble if I did, because I haven't really fully thought it through. I'm currently uh, co-teaching a seminar at Amherst College with a colleague in another department called Wadjuris Prince and Social Thought on, um, on, on, on the animal and law. Um, and among other things, we, we, we were teaching uh, uh, two-thirds of the autobiography of, of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, and Gandhi's practice in many ways through hunger, through hunger strikes and through his asceticism uh, provide, provides a model. And there's an interesting linkage from, that goes from Thoreau to Gandhi that goes also to, the, to Bobby Sands um, uh, regarding, regarding that form of civil disobedience. Um, bodies speak. I mean, this is one of the things that Judith Butler has made increasingly clear in, in her work ever since precarious life, I think. Um, and in her most recent book on assembly, um, I think that, that becomes clearer than ever. One of the things that's interesting about that next step is that it has to do with bodies in mass, bodies together, bodies networking together. And, you know, and that's also something that is emphasized by William Conley. Uh, whenever he talks about it, he's relying upon Belusian theorizing of swarming. Um, now, the, the problem with all of this is that it can work both ways. And the right certainly has gotten ahead of the left, at least in the United States, regarding the way in which they are able to put together assemblages that resonate with each other and, and project quite powerfully. Um, I, I know I'm drifting away from that question concerning hunger itself. But hunger serves very powerfully as well for us because as we enter into this, this new epic, um, there's going to be an awful lot more hunger. Um, and hunger is an instrument of, of politics and political power is something that we're all going to have to think more about. Um, so that's all I got. <laughs> yes, sir. So the other focus of the analysis of the story has to, of course, be on the narrative. Um, and it, to some extent, the story is about the narrative <coughs> and not about the part of it, to the degree to which it is an analysis of American liberalism and the degree to which the narrator embodies a particular kind of mid-19th century American liberalism. Do you have any comments on, on that? Yeah, the, the, the <coughs> part of the reading of the Deleuze is that the, the, it's sort of like, a, uh, the, the, he makes an argument that what happens is, is that this story out, this starts out kind of like a conventional English a, in, a English piece of fiction from, from the mid-1800s and then does this sudden radical flip away from it. Um, uh, the lawyer, the, I know I, that I neglected the lawyer a lot other than narrator in this. And there is this question of what the limits of liberalism might be. And the, 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 I think that what Melville does with the lawyer is fascinating in the sense that he shows that the liberalism that the lawyer is, is operating under is a liberalism of conformity, right? I mean, you know, because what sets off the lawyer finally from all the charity that he wants to give Barbie is his embarrassment when his clients come into the office. And he cannot stand up to them and say, well, you know, he's weird, he's odd, but I'm trying to take care of him, right? Because that's not going to work. So, so, so the limits of liberalism are illustrated by that. But I think there's something else going on with the, with the, with the lawyer, and I can't
can't really pinpoint it. Um, uh, and you know, this is sort of a first go through. I mean, it, and I really don't know the secondary literature on, on, on Bartleby the Scrivener well enough to sort of find out more about who he is. The fact that it's a story of Wall Street, I think, is kind of uncanny. Um, and yeah, there's, good, there's good stuff on, on the strikes of the period and their relationship to the story in the secondary literature. Yeah. Too. Okay, well, I'll have to look for the next iteration of that then. But, but you know, I think your question is, is right on. I think you, sir, mm -hmm. you know, thank you. Fascinating talk. But I was wondering, when we think of or talk of resistance or strike or even refusal, we usually have in mind uh, some sort of establishment against which this is exercised. But the situation that we're experiencing now is more like a civil war, where there is no established authority, whether it's the liberals or the right. So it's more of a, more of a war between the different kinds of discursive forces, the different kinds of you know, you know, economic interests. So how do we think of resistance uh, in the current situation? I, I wasn't able to really understand. Yeah, but yeah, I, I would um, hopefully agreeably disagree with you a little bit. Um, uh, I, think, I, I, I think that we very well might be entering into a state that is close to civil war, if not in it. But it's not because there isn't um, a, a power center again, that is being pushed against, or a power center that is indeed anxious and trying to continue to dominate. And this is, the, this, I, I agree, with, I'm enough of a Marxist still, <laughs> even in my old age, but I have to agree some of Lazzarato whenever he says, this is, this is the corporatism of neoliberalism and finance capital at the end of its tether. Um, now, the, where we might be in agreement is, is that if it is falling apart at this point, then we are going to have a system of um, anarchy in a bad, bad way coming up. This is one of the this is one of the huge global fears that I think all of us are sharing right now. That Trumpism, and, as if an American form of fascism, could accelerate that process of disintegration. Um, and if that is the case, then, then uh, we have a lot more to worry about than, than even we're already worried about. So, you know, but the question is whether there is still an, ob an object against which resistance can adequately, adequately find itself. I still think that there is. And I think it has to do with the inverted, uh, the inverted totalitarianism, uh, to paraphrase Sheldon Woolen of the late capitalist society. Um, you know, it's, it's just not working. Um, you, you, sir, and then, then, then you, and then, yeah. So, yeah, so thanks for the great talk. Um, the, you, you commented at the end that it's rather grim. And I think that one of the things that's so grim, actually, about your talk is that you went about your business um, with the confident uh, assurance and assumption that there will be a President Trump and a President Trump administration. And I think it's very likely that there will be, but I think that many of us right now, when I speak for myself, are refusing to actually fully acknowledge or accept that this will happen. At the same time that I'm aware, you know, we, we are complicated creatures. We can hold two contradictory kinds of things in our mind. And I, so one of the things that really was grim for me was just like, oh my God, yeah, you know, session is going to be a you know, and, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah. And it seems that the refusal that we might be considering, so that number one, I think, I would prefer not to. Not <laughs> me not too. To <laughs> my president. So right now I am being Barbie in that respect. But the Republicans refused to acknowledge Barack Obama as a legitimate president for eight years. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we do simply acknowledge that, as your talk in some ways did, then we are going to just become the Democrats, who are in fact going to acknowledge and appease and so forth. And so I guess when I think about some of the ways that we can resist, I think one of the things we can do, and this is where Barbara will be individually or collectively could offer a model, would be simply to refuse to accept his vision. Now, what that means on an individual and collective basis for us is, might be one thing. What it means for the Democrats would be something that would be different. It would involve them in 
do we what the Republicans did for eight years, that I think they damn well should. But I don't know, that was one of the things that yeah. would have been interesting if your talk had been able to hold both of those. I mean, we're in this eschaton to borrow Kevin's thing for, uh, you know, the center for next year. We are yeah. in this period of waiting for the end of the world. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of things. Um, the first thing I thought, and you'll forgive me, is you know, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. <laughs> but that being said, there are mo there, uh, you're right in one way, and that is denying, trying to deny the legitimacy of Trump um, uh, is one strategy that 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 um, all of all of the electronic news media of cable. Whenever they interview any single Democrat, this is the, who's in Congress. This is the question they ask: Are you going to do what the Republicans did? And rather than say, "That sounds like a good idea to me," they say, "Well, when we can, we'll work for him. But if he does this or that, we will fight him the whole way." <coughs> and that is that is indeed that is in, indeed the normalization of the normalization of this presidency. Um, one of the interestingly things that, see I'm addicted to this stuff, right, so I, I, I was watching the reruns of MSNBC at 4 o'clock this morning, um, and apparently at the Kennedy, I know this, at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, every four years for the last four election cycles, they have hosted a two-day conference in which they invite the campaign management of the two major party candidates to come together to talk about what happened in the election. Uh, last night was quite interesting because they got into a screaming match with each other, mm -hmm. in which Kellyanne Conway uh, was outraged that anyone would think that she participated in a racist campaign. Can you say that to my face? And the assistant campaign manager for Clinton said, well, it's true. This is what you did. And it escalated, and she says, "Well, you're not you're not going to accept the legitimacy of, of of the Trump presidency." And the response was, "As long as he has racist white supremacists working in the West Wing of the White House, you're damn right." Mm -hmm. So there are moments there are moments like that that are out there already. We'll, we'll see what happens. Um, uh, given the abdication of the one corporate party to Trump already, namely the Republicans. Um, I do not see Chuck Schumer as a profound courage coming along. So I, you know, so I, I can't see that. That's why I worked on the assumption that we, that, that we are, are going that way. But you know, we, we can always, we can always, um, yeah. Um, so this is a slightly impressionistic question. Um, so I think of Melville as being particularly haunted by the Indian Wars in New England in the 17th century, and I think his work is being suffused by that. And I wonder if um, you thought about that with Barbara and if, because I think we're similarly haunted by much more perhaps in the wars. The war on terror um, conditions so much of contemporary politics, and it's ground now. We don't even need to refer to it very often. So I wonder if you thought about that kind of dollar that's useful to Well, one of the, well, yeah, the war on terror is an amorphous phrase, right? And one of the things that I think is going on that is that Ken and I were actually talking about this at one point, um, that the United States since, since World War II, just about every war that we've gotten into has been a mistaken adventure and been done, been done on mistaken premises. Uh, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and indeed the post 9-11 wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and the more generalized war on terror. Um, uh, I'm a, one of the things that you mentioned is haunting. And frankly, I think that the, we are haunted every bit as much as contemporary Americans by our aboriginals and, 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 and by their ghostly presence. Um, as we are by any uh, other of our original sins of the country, including chattel slavery. Um, so, and 
and there's an externality to the question of terror that I don't think has the same bite or the same force, but that's just an intuition too. Um, the more, you know, Trump has already backed down from his waterboarding thing, saying that that good general who he's just nominated for Secretary of Defense convinced him that, you know, a pack of cigarettes and a six pack of beer is a much more effective way of eliciting information. And I think he did that because he realizes that playing, playing the, the tortured card isn't going to work quite as well. There's too much squeamishness about it right now. Right? So he might bring it back at a certain point, depending upon how bad things get, but I don't know. I know that's a rambling and inadequate answer, but um, I, I really have to think a lot more about what we're haunted by. Yeah. One of the things is that I think about when I, I read for me is like, um, the lawyer is haunted by his opacity. Like he can't, he's inscrutable, he can't read him. He doesn't, he doesn't fit into his moral economy, obviously, but like, um, that's what's so disturbing about him, right? You know, there's even these, like, there's this funny moment where he goes back to the office that was vacant and Barbie's still sitting there, right? And he was, and Barbie was sitting there, you know, like resting upon the banister. And he said, what are you doing here, Barbie? Barbie said, I'm standing upon the banister. Right. And he won't give him anything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, we don't have anything. We don't, we have scraps. And, and like on one hand, we see him as this great figure of political resistance, but he also is, he's inscrutable. And I feel like in some ways, the, in <coughs> our, we've entered this era of like, like the politics of opacity. Like, you know, after the election, the pundits were like, what the what? You know, the polls are wrong, right? You know, no one all know David Brooks was like, what happened, you know? And, you well, know, that's, that's, like, that's, all politics, yeah. that's the way of life, it's but, just, but it's I like, understand what you're saying. In some ways, like, that, when, when you were talking about it, like, Barbie is, he's a figure that kind of stands in for that, and also, like, what is this politics? What are we supposed to adopt? Like, what, you know, and, and there's this, this uncertainty about the way that politics, both on the left and the right, are operating right now, right? And, 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 and I feel like, well, this goes back to Deleuze's comment on, on all this stuff, right? There, there's no right side up, no upside down. I mean, it's just, it, you know, and, and that's the disorienting element in it. I like the way in which you started with your initial description, because one of the things I, I failed to, in this rather grim analysis, fail to note is that this is a hilarious story. I mean, it, 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 it's much more a comedy than it is, a, than it is anything else. Um, and, the, and the comedy has to do with this, this object in the center of it, right? Uh, which, which simply, simply can't be, sim simply can't be explained or absorbed in terms of the conventions of it. Yeah, but you're right. We're in a period of great confusion, and, and the problem is fascism thrives on confusion. Um, yeah. Well, maybe that confusion has a lot to do with the speed that we're moving, and it seems to me that a lot of the sort of pundits. They're talking about getting things wrong is that they seem to be theorizing from a fixed point. Right? When in fact if they don't realize that they're also being swept up in the tide as well. You know, and I think it you know it's fair I think it bears remembering that back in two thousand eight after Obama's victory, right, and certainly I think probably a lot of us believe that it would, you know, maybe be another twenty years, you know, before the GOP could ever even have the hope of, of recapturing you know, the White House after um, you know all the uh, yeah. mishaps you know of uh, the W. Uh, it wasn't just after that. It was, it was on November up until up until the the director of the FBI sort of indicated he was investigating Clinton again. Well, they were talking about the permanent permanent majority, the permanent presidency among the Democrats and the Senate majority that was going to occur, and and the recovery of governorships. But what I'm not clear about um, is. You know, how much has the country changed in the past eight years? I mean, you know, what, um, I mean, certainly I think from the, from the left, I mean, you know, you know, I think the perspective is that, well, it didn't change enough, right? I mean, there are a lot of things, especially like in the area of uh, equality, you know, where there's very little progress. But then, you know, people on the right would argue that the country changed dramatically, you know, in, in, you know, over the past eight years. So which one is, I mean, is there a way of sort of arguing that, well, yes, the country did change, I mean, that, that's what seems to be a really uh, sort of missing element, right? I mean, you know, where are we 
you know, in uh, relation to uh, what the country used to be, you know, eight, eight, eight years ago. And and maybe that's um, also, I don't know, perhaps a way of of thinking of our own perspective as being in motion, right? That 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 unless we're able to sort of acknowledge that we're also speeding along, that 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 our um, models will not match, you know, this reality, which is also you know changing very rapidly. Yeah. Yeah, not, yeah, I think that's a, an excellent insight. I mean, you know, what what can we do with it? In one way, in one way, the the, the metrics of quote unquote economic progress, right, over the past eight years have been fairly solid, uh, and the, the Affordable Care Act has transformed health insurance in this country, regardless of of all the things. Problem is, is that this other ch change that has occurred, the rapidity with which information is disseminated, the blurring of all sorts of sources of information regarding credibility, legitimacy, uh, the, the vast expansion in that sense of our reliance upon, upon the interweb, as I frankly call it, and its tubes and everything, um, uh, and the rise of social media. All, the, all of these different things give us that, that that sense and the ability of people to discern those old-fashioned facts has been has been disappearing. The unemployment rate is down 4.6 percent as of today, right? And yet, and yet, we under, we understand that there's an economic crisis. Why? Because we've been told it repeatedly, 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 and intensely. And we've been told not to trust any of those reliable indicators in terms of the truth. So part of it is, I mean, a lot of that has to do with this speeded up, speeded up set of information sources. Now what's going to happen with it? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It, it's just a, a half a thought that occurred to me as you were speaking there. Uh, when you, you speak of Bartleby and the radical individualism of, uh, of the figure, which I think sounds right and hence maybe a limit of taking him as a model, but the, the Scrivener part uh, is interesting, right? So, what, and, uh, and you were, I'm thinking, you, you, you compared him to the Xerox machine of today. Oh, yeah, this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, like. Share, you share your thoughts. Exactly. You, this, is where, this is where you're going, yeah. yeah if, if, if you were to not retweet the thing, uh, you know, it, it seems like the, the Xerox machine has gotten out of hand on, on the one hand, it's also, where resistance could happen. I mean, if we could, I don't know what kind of agency we can grant these mechanisms, but if we could think of what agency they have or what kind of sabotage. Well, actually, actually we, can, we have an example before us in the pre-election period, and that is whenever uh, uh, the entire internet went down because mm -hmm. of the sabotage exactly. of the quote-unquote internet of things, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the, the subversion and the attack on the inter internet occurred because, and you probably know this better than, than I do because you're studying it <coughs> more directly and intensely, but the, 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 the hackers who got into the Internet of Things, they were able to bring down the Internet as a whole because we have refrigerators communicating with toasters, communicating with lighting fixtures, right? So that's, that sense of vulnerability and interdependency that exists in terms of our appliances, right? You know, it might be better if, if if it was a set of interdependencies that existed among our bodies. Um, or if we can somehow, you know, yeah, this, is, this is old, but it's probably potent. If we could, if we could somehow um, um, uh, transform, transform ourselves so that we will be part of the integrated circuit, paraphrased Donna Haraway from long ago, in Manifesto for Cyborgs. That might yet be another. That might yet be another, another way of humanizing. It also yeah. invites us to think of. So in the, in the story of Bartleby, you've got the Scrivener as a necessary step in the, in for the lawyer to, right. to, to, to for the law to be the law. Right. Uh, and here you can imagine what kind of law is being either enacted or thwarted either by the the, the incessant retweeting or by the hacking of it. Yeah. Yeah. Way in the back now, I'll, I'll get you again and then you. Um, I, I don't know if I don't know enough about Barbie, but I, I don't understand and maybe you could clear up a point. Um, when his refusal leads to his death, is that a sort of um, sacrifice or like martyrdom for speaking the truth, or is it, is it foolish? <coughs> because he wouldn't conform even to the land. What's the, the death part of it? I don't know if I'm going to be just. 
what is the death part of it? <laughs> um, uh, is it foolishness? Is it sacrifice? Is it? I think, and I think Melville, uh, Melville uh, probably is thinking in sacrificial terms. Um, uh, but there's, there's another part of this question of mortality and, and his death in silence, and that is, is, you know, in the largest symbolic sense, I mean, this, this is representing the finite limit of, of, of any politics. Um, but, you know, your, 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 I was going to surrender and say, your guess is as good as mine, and I think maybe that's what I will do with it for now. Yeah, but go ahead. I, I don't want to take a lot more time because I already talked, but I, I, feel, I feel like I want to say something about the way that the election is being narrated. Um, Hillary Clinton won this election by, by at least two and a half million votes. votes. You know, I actually skipped an amendment so, at the very so beginning say saying that, that I was succumbing to a false right. narrative. Yeah. To talk about the, the country having changed or that this is an evidence that the country has changed seems to me false. The government has been seized. Yep. There's been a structural coup yep. of governmentality that's been going on you know, for well over 10 years. This is the second presidential election in which yep. the wrong person seized Power. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important going forward that we differentiate between the seizure of governmentality and changes in the country because I prefer not to believe that the Trump administration represents the people, the majority of the United States, because they didn't get that vote. And if you look at the votes on the ballot measures across the country, on schools, on minimum wage, on recreational drug use, they all indicate a different kind of politics in that. Yeah, I take I take your point, um, and indeed I did. I actually wrote in my notes to, to comment that, in a certain, that I was trying to distinguish between Trump gaining the presidency through the Electoral College and trying to resist succumbing to what you rightly are calling a false narrative of the election, but at the same time, right? Okay. To, I myself do not believe that the United States is a representative democracy. Um, and I don't believe it has been one um, uh, ever. But it, it gets closer sometimes and gets further away at others. And, and um, the fact that Trump won the Electoral College. He said something shrewd after that before he started going on as sort of like we won by a landslide, blah, 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 blah. He said, look, if it had been a, if it had been a straightforward, whoever gets the most votes wins the election election, I would, have, I, would have, I would have campaigned that way. And we would find out what would have happened then, right? Um, and you know, so we don't really quite know what the alternative terms of that would be, although I do understand you want to say that our country is not this, right? Um, the difficulty is, is, yeah, I'm afraid it is, right? In part because of our institutional structure and our constitution, which we live under, and which still enjoys the legitimacy of the majority of the American public, even though I find it to be an insane document, um, is accepted, and indeed, right? The normalization of Trump by the news media is one thing. The acceptance of his election by Hillary Clinton is another. Right? And the fact of the matter is, is that he will be inaugurated on January 20th as President of the United States, and he will enjoy legitimacy as a consequence of that, at least in the conventional sense. So, so you know, yeah, we can, we can hope that somehow, that somehow, one way or another, the levers of the levers of power that that um, enable uh, better and happier outcomes uh, will will uh, come the way of those of us who want to have a more inclusive, happy, and and uh, and meet <laughs> country than we currently have, but. 
but um, I, you know, I, 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 we might have to agree to disagree about where the where the government where the government ends and where the country begins, right? Because it's it's very tricky, and very blurry. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks. I want to follow up on um, I guess two matters: one about the reading of the story, and the other about your Marxist history. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, start with the Marxism first. I was thinking, as you were talking about Joshua Clover's new book, recent book, <clears throat> you know, which basically argues that the age of, of passive resistance to capitalism is over, that the strike has gone back to riot, right? Mm -hmm. And that if that's the case, right, Bartleby is, is very much a creature of the 19th century, not a creature or a model for the 21st century. So, I'm interested, first of all, in right, how you seem to see that differently if Bartleby has continuing relevance. And then just to say a quick word about Bartleby, go back to Greg's reminder that a lot of scholarship on this has been about the, you know, the refusal to work as, right. uh, related to the 19th century strike. But just as the narrator is ironized, um, you know, as a sentimental liberal humanist, um, who's totally effective and completely complicit, I mean, could this not be a story about how Bartleby is also Ironized is utterly ineffective. Dies in the end. Uh, that's just that's nothing. That's totally right. individual. Yeah, that, that reading is uh, to the extent that I know the secondary literature. That reading is way out there. That that Barnaby is a satirization of the rough <coughs> example um, of, of that. Um, and so, yeah. Now, on the Marxism side, I'm not really a Marxist. I just pretend to be one on TV once in a while, so to speak. Um, uh, and, and but the question of the general. The question of the general strike, um, Connolly approaches it in more Deleuzean terms than he does in term, than, than he does in Marxist terms, and the whole question has to do with in an age of informatics, and in an age in which so much of capital is abstract, uh, shifts can it, shifts might occur in sudden and in unexpected ways. Uh, you know, now that might be the romance of the 21st century, uh, but it's up for all of us to. to Judge. Professor Gahl. Hmm. Okay, cool. um, so I first of all have a kind of a factual question. Did you decide to talk about RLB before the election? Oh yeah, long well, before. Right. And so this is my question, is just that I'm I'm wondering what the frame of your talk and your reading was or was going to be. Uh, when you didn't know, yeah. when, when you, you when, right, because I, I thought I had read it on the schedule like earlier oh, in the yes, semester, yes. And, and your frame now is so much the election. So I'm just wondering what 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 uh, you were thinking okay. of yeah, as the frame of the talk before. Yeah, the, the, original, the original conceit, and I think it still appears in terms of the thing, was the mentioning of Trump and Bernie Sanders as the two two alternative approaches to what might be going on and how Bartleby might be a model for a particular kind of politics that they were invoking. I, and um, at the time, I, you know, I was like everyone else. Um, I was, it wasn't until September that I started predicting that Trump was going to win. Um, uh, at the time, I was simply thinking, well, let's explore, let's explore this concept of refusal and try to figure it out. But since so many people were saying that what happened in this election was a sea change and that it was a rejection, right, and, uh, and on the part of so many people of, of politics as it currently exists, it seemed to me that I had to, I had to grapple with that and try to distinguish between refusal and, and reaction. So that's, 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 that's the only thing. And, you know, obviously I, things were becoming, for me, throughout the fall as I was thinking about coming here, <laughs> almost said having to come here, <laughs> right? Um, it, 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 you know, obvious, obvious, for me it was obvious that I was not going to be able to avoid a more direct confrontation with the election, Espe especially since, you know, I, you know, I'm still shocked that I say it, but at the same time I think it needs to be said over and over again. We've elected our first fascist as president of the United States. As Donald Trump every formal requirement uh, of, of what constitutes a fascist. Now, you know, I, I mean, I was joking earlier, I'm currently reading a biography of Hitler, and, and you know, you can sort of paraphrase the vice presidential debate on Lloyd Benson, you know, uh, it, it calls out the Anquil. You know, Mr. Trump, you know, I knew Hitler, <laughs> I've talked to Hitler, Hitler was, I won't say a friend of mine, 
you, Mr. Trump, are no Hitler, right? In other words, it's a degraded kind of fascism that we're going through right now, but it is, but, and, and it will have, it obviously it will have its own markers, but, um, uh, and some of what we will call repression, people will simply say a return to law and order. For instance, we are going to be having a return to, to we were going, the, the enormous boat of mass incarceration had, has been nudged around a little bit during the Obama administration. I give them credit for that. There's going to be immediate turnaround in, the, in, the, in, in, in regard to that. They've said it. Um, and whether Sessions is approved of the Attorney General or not, we are going to have a doubling down on mass incarceration in this country over the next four years. So, that, so you know, so I, 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 I couldn't help it, but, that, but that's sort of, the, that's sort of the, the, the trajectory that this took, right? He says, nay saying, I say, ah, oh, I'd prefer not to, <laughs> right? That, that might work, then, and it went from there, so, yeah. Um, what you said about that, you know, not being a representative democracy, I mean, the United States has never been a representative yeah. democracy. I mean, the disenfranchisement of women and blacks for you know, most of our history, and you know, it's just established to, to keep power out of the hands of people. Yeah. And then also about the you know, fascism thriving on chaos. And Trump is appointing factions from the right that don't, that can't stand each other. Right? I mean, and I think that even bringing in... But that's um, his Game of Thrones right now. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't watch it. <laughs> but, but, you know... Or no, 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 it's called, um, what's it called? Something of Rivals. Cabinet of Rivals. Cabinet of Rivals, or yeah, whatever. But, but, but bringing, but bringing, <laughs> but bringing in, you know, Romney and, you know, trying to bring in these people from the right, who just you know completely oppose each other as sort of you know a way to maintain destabilization all around him, and then just keeping his children close and yeah. creating this kind of core of power. And I think that it's exact. This is exactly as you're saying. This yeah. you know, this is how yeah. you build. I have a feeling Romney ain't going to make it. Yeah, but, I mean, but even but, sort of just but like just he's, uh, he's but even so, your larger him. point is what your larger point is well taken. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I think that this the kind of a destabilization is you know I think that. We think of him as an idiot, right? You know, Trump's an idiot, Trump's an idiot, but he might not be as much of an idiot as we think. Because, yeah, no, he's an idiot. No, but in terms of the, what, yeah, yeah, of, no, the, I, the way that, that things I, are being, I, I, yeah, I actually don't yeah, think, I yeah. actually don't think that uh, Trump is an idiot. I just think that he's illiterate. Yeah, um, and ignorant. Um, and, um, yeah, ignorant or post-literate or something. I mean. He gets all of his information, all of his information in watching television. In that sense, he sort of reminds you of the idiot savant Chance the Gardener. Yes, yes, yes. But one, one yeah. last one, I think we need to wrap up. I just want to say, when you say, we will in our way down to President on January 20th, I know. physically refuses I, I to know. accept that. And I think it's dangerous because I think we do have a recount, three recounts going on, and we do have an electoral college that's going to have to meet. Now, I think it's extremely likely that we will nominate Trump, but I think it's a little dangerous for us just to be saying that. And I know that if the situation was reversed, and if there was a Democrat in office, and there were Republicans running recounts and so forth, that they would not be saying we are going to elect Hillary Clinton as president. And I think that that's the part of the talk I'm, that has, my body has been resisting as yeah. you've been talking. Yeah. When you say those things. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, probably, that's, probably, that's probably the way we should end this. I'm very sorry. <laughs>